specialized up to with from live coding to virtual meetings? Um, I'm just introduce about this talk. So I tried to, uh, you could find the paper and read it actually, but I tried to uh, make concentrate you on few concepts which uh, made possible this transition because it's really, uh, I think, a uh, dream from the long time. But everybody of us, I think, uh, who are in this auditory, auditory know the failing of virtual worlds which were in uh, 90s when computer couldn't run them. And Facebook, twi Twitters, and some social media stuff come out. And, and again, we are all, or most of us, sitting in text editors and couldn't um, move forward. So um, it's just an image. And um, we all know the self-exploitative environments. One of the most known in Squeak, and now I'm just doing this in Squeak. So what I mean by this, uh, now I will close my full screen. So it is the space, a 3D space of Crockett, which is run on Squeak image. And maybe you know this, what is self-explorative environment for me? Maybe you understand that. It means that everything is in image, so and all source code and all methods and all your stuff just uh, saved in one binary image. And uh, now I will show you uh, a simple object of this environment, for example, a uh, keyboard, which you all already know, who work in Squeak. Um, I just put it on my, and yes, it's playing, <laughs> but it has a latency <laughs> and something like that. So it is implemented in small talk. But uh, what I do, uh, I just, in small talk, connect the small talk to super collider and um, just run it. So here it is, and uh, a super collider was made actually, and <laughs> a lot of was made uh, and uh, inherited from small talk. I use it uh, properties, just one um, line could make this connection. It's just like a trick I mm, executed. Oh, sorry, to see. And on small talk site, I just enter. Uh, sorry, this is objects in small talk. What you want to see, and I open a super collider clever keyboard. And so this now running this uh, sending or some messages, and I have a browser inside this uh, image. Where could I just uh, change? Not uh, maybe like in live coding sending comments, but I need to change in a method body. And <coughs> when saving it, it uh, really um, changed me. I just show you how it's done. This is keyboard. This is my. Uh, it's <laughs> not a good view, but I uh, choose another <coughs> instrument for my mouse and um, just play again. So this is another synth. And now I come back to my world. It is about self-exploitative environments. So everything just in one image, and you need it to work with source code, with um, uh, files, and others. So <coughs> the same environment is appeared about uh, near future in browser with the name of Lada Kernel, and you could uh, try it. But I'm going forward to virtual worlds, and it is collaborative, self-exploitative uh, environments where we have uh, several users that could interact. Uh, and this is uh, open croquet, open quack. We use this. So just to mention that. And also, I'll show you that it works in browser. <coughs> so it's technology from the latest one or year. It's a virtual framework and sandbox. Uh, the projects from IDL laboratory in, in United States. Um, so these are the concepts which I want to, um, which inspire uh, this work, this paper. So in 2006 was the project Sophie. Somebody maybe know, it is the project from Institute, the future of book. 
so they think about that all our programs are really uh, work in the way that we have a one app and a lot of media that uh, come to this app. And so app is just uh, single. And as Sophie, idea was that no, no distinction between app and media. So with every new media, you could redefine the app. And when you, uh, for example, should give me your notes, you should distribute these notes and the app. It's like uh, everybody have a different super collider and, and it's different in internal in score, like a uh, core. It's the inspiration. The second inspiration is Ometa. It's uh, the new uh, object oriented language for uh, party matching. So actually, if you imagine, what can I do? So we are really working with one virtual machine or language and having some like object space which are programmed in this language. Ometa could do the following that we have every object with its own virtual machine and with its own language coexist in united environment. So it's the second uh, factor for traveling to a virtual being. Um, then that, uh, the methodology and technology from the 80s from Kenny Lieberman, you know, maybe about software agents. So that uh, now actually and we live coders are uh, um, communicate with the computer and calling it using uh, just as user and app, no intermedia actually. And but Henry Lieberman have in 80s a concept of software agents. Now we could project it to avatar. So every your interaction with computer should be done not by you, not by the user, but your um, implementation like an avatar. So you're not coding will code your avatar. So you uh, working on Kbert with your avatar only. Another assumption is uh, virtual time. So a lot of um, talks was in here and also in programming uh, on computer science conference about virtual time. And uh, here we see, uh, so the problem is really solved all is about synchronization. But virtual time is really not implemented yet. And this technology um, come maybe closer uh, to this solution. So um, I'm just going later. And we introduce this like integration of uh, of language or meta, which could uh, define for component or object on language of virtual machine in this virtual framework, collaborative environment with partial virtual time and um, avatars. So it means that I show you we could run a, a, a browser and for object we could um, add some grammars, for example, um, a grammar of Lisp or JavaScript or small talk or maybe a logo. Then, um, so I want to show some demonstration. You should see that here I'm traveling with my avatar, and now I will just to continue with super collider. I close this keyboard and I try to open such keyboard in this world. So you should imagine that I need. Oh, it, it is. I have a very really great picture, and here you couldn't see. Here is the avatar. <laughs> so I'm, I'm walking. I'm just going this. So I run OSS support, uh, just to a server, which will uh, get a, a, a messages, and I create um, a to your table, and run. Uh, Reactivision application, and then this uh, interaction I just not print, but have this one. So you see, actually, I just open the. Uh, so you see that this. My two marker are sending uh, this 
uh, messages uh, composed to OSC, and e e everybody in the network should just connect to this uh, distributed uh, application and uh, also send. But it's supposed that every client, <laughs> or this is, uh, we're talking not about client server architecture, but really pure distributed, should also have a separate collider, the whole thing. So um, now I close my, this <laughs> Rectivision framework. and show you in the browser what is done in the browser. I run the server, the local server, on my machine. Sorry, it's not um, this one. So, this is one person who actually come to the space and I log in just by one. I show you with. Uh, And I get an incognito window to show the second person, which go to the same um, server. Um. Oh, sorry, it's. I'm sorry. It was working, but. Okay, I'm going to this. So I create the world for you. So just create blank world. <coughs> so actually this technology brings what I uh, said about open crooked architecture to uh, the browser. So that we have everything in JavaScript. And uh, here is realized this replicated model of some notion of virtual time. So especially it means that every message and every uh, is go through the reflector, reflector, which distribute these messages to all instances of the same like island. And so all participants have the same model of space, and it uh, distinguish the messages inside space and external. So for example, all hardware controllers, mouses, it's all external, and they really like um, move forward this time uh, in care to, um, to start the, the simulation. So um, I just open, for example, create an object, it's built uh, uh, using node class system in JavaScript, uh, and it, it uh, uses a pure prototype-oriented programming here. And uh, so this framework was done by a sandbox project. It's available. But we connect Ometa to this project. So I create an instance. And now I open script editor, and I define a simple grammar from Ometa to parse my new uh, strings on my language. The simple language which could add, it's uh, from tutorial from a uh, creator from Meta, Alexander Roth. Um. Just create. When I define the grammar, we ex so actually, uh, Ometa make these functions available for parsing this uh, grammar inside uh, space. So now I open the uh, create 
a new method to test our uh, new language. I have some to copy and paste here. So here you see the primitive expression, which will be parsed inside. I save uh, the method, and I open the um, developer tools. I think this will open to show you the result. So I call uh, the method now. And you see there, uh, it's, um, sorry, how to, you see here the results, it's actually 100, so it's parsed from s f from string. Now, the more complex e uh, e example that I uh, added here already is a uh, L system generator. So we could realize, realize this L system generator just in JavaScript, in functions, but actually it is better to parse its strings in a more functional way. So we have a metagrammers for that. So for example, I made a Sierpinski triangle. And if I actually select this triangle, I could see the uh, all grammars for that. So one for um, analyzing the first string, then building the structure, and then parsing this structure uh, here, I think. And then also one simple parser, like the trivial logo. So forward and turn around. And so um, when I have a GUI, like interface, user interface, for this um, object, actually, I could um, test. I could change uh, the string, and it will go through this. Uh, to this uh, um, parson uh, ge generators. So it all coexists inside one environment. So for example, if some people, uh, uh, some another left coder, come to this space and will program his own language, he will program in his own language, using his own grammars. And I will program in my own grammars. And they coexist. Of course, the, the, uh, it, it's not a real s s solution to um, um, interact between these languages, and maybe it's uh, the, the problem which should be solved in LNK team, which <laughs> they do a lot to, but um, for now, not to be waiting, we could experiment with this. So uh, being in uh, a complex environment, uh, where you could use uh, some predefined things, I could experiment in also with language. Because if you come to this environment, you need to program in JavaScript. And if I want to program in supercolor or Lisp, I could implement it, and in a better way, not in hard-coded, but in, in more virtual, in a, a, a meta-level way. So this. And we, um, I return to my presentation. Um, sorry. <laughs> so. Screen. So this is about projects um, um, uh, that we try to experiment. Uh, for example, uh, here is um, um, uh, Tanya Sashani, an architect and designer who uh, made a paper with uh, me. We experimented with some uh, musical experiments where we could or wanted to make some interaction between uh, 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 m musicians who sit on the chairs with sensors and uh, it is a super collider that um, chair just go near uh, another people and uh, produce the sounds. And this chair uh, could be not one, but several chairs, and how they could interconnect with, with each other. And we uh, just try to implement it in this uh, uh, virtual world trying. Of course, it is an experiment. It's not finished, really. It's just, uh, uh, but it's it, it one of um, experiment that we could do. Another experiment that we uh, also do is a cover system. A cover system is actually a four walls in which we have a lot of uh, visuals, but the problem is th that it's a really complex system. <laughs> and what uh, these open source tools uh, give us that um, every, uh, I think, people, <laughs> uh, hmm? yeah. 
yeah, uh, could made it and also extend to. And uh, the problem with this system is that it's difficult to reprogram it. In, um, so you need some script editors or script languages, which are. Um, so these virtual worlds actually easily solve this problem of extending these environments and reprogram in real time. Um, so this is actually the screenshot of this. multi touch table, also you see an avatar, what I have shown you. We made some uh, to a piano keyboard and experiment with the markers. So I, I just want that you experiment with this. And, um, so maybe uh, the questions. Yeah, maybe could we, have one, we have time for like, the traditional one question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hmm? No, no questions. I'm sure people oh. will talk to you more later. Oh, it's um, a... <laughs> yeah, yeah, I understand. Uh, the people are standing around the chair. Were, the, were you capturing their movement into the virtual reality? I mean, there, like, you saw the picture of people standing around you and the picture of people in virtual reality. So they're being censored. <laughs> Not censored, that means <laughs> centralized. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, could, can, could you like, could that be walking in your virtual reality, in reality? <laughs> you should imagine as an artist. So it is a tool really for artists. It's really experimental. It just fails down every time, and you just experiment and dig in it. And because it is all open source, it's uh, and and uh, this environment is for experimenting with new languages, with new p uh, paradigms. So when uh, yesterday was uh, the discussion between live coding, live programming, so in, in small talk, uh, for example, we have, and you could uh, modify and, and method the body, and you could just make it do it. Yeah. And in JavaScript, you have uh, also this time. So it's, um, um, what I show you about OSC, you could just um, use this environment as a spider, which could produce this super color code, because it's really, uh, produce this code, and when you will look a Vlad coder who program, <laughs> actually he could program in, in, in some language, yeah. and show you in a screencast super collider code, yeah. <laughs> and, and and so it's really the new. But the main maybe f uh, feature, or um, um, uh, what you want to say you that everything, what here you see is done with intermediate object as an avatar. So I, I, it's like if I want to make a text, I should bring the window with text window and then to, to program this environment through my avatar. And, and this changed the game like in live coding because, because you have a, a, a lot of virtual stuff which uh, will move forward in, art in another level because now we are like uh, mm, puppeteers. <laughs> Uh, just uh, just a keyboard uh, which uh, with arms on this hardware which is not uh, good enough for now uh, it's good <laughs> but <laughs> okay Thanks so much. Mm. Yeah, good All right, so, so next up we I'm have just stop this okay uh,
Okay. Um, well, today I, I am presenting a short paper that proposes an approach to the activity of lay coding as an artistic configuration uh, constitute in a creative practice from improvisa improvisation, openness, and constant e exploration. I just want to share some thoughts about sociality, sociability in lay coding and uh, from an anthropological approach uh, whose method is um, ethnography and I, I won't uh, get in, in detail uh, about ethnography because Giovanni uh, just uh, already did it uh, and he was very, uh, he, he made a very detailed presentation of the ethnography. Um, well, like coding activity arises from the start as a collective activity, uh, both keeping interaction with each other in mailing lists through the publication uh, of uh, their programming languages during performances uh, by opening a connection with the audience um, and many, many other ways of uh, interaction and, for example, another a uh, new one is Extramuros that we saw uh, last session uh, and, and another example of interaction. Um, in late coding activity, there is a core intention, intention to explore the capabilities to skillfully improvise with code in a challenging way. But there is also an intention of further developing a kind of participatory, participatory community in which everyone can participate without being required programming mastery. Um, these are some uh, quotations from, from the fieldwork. Um, and um, in order to uh, ascertain the participatory intention, I would like to refer to sociability in terms of imagined community. Um, according with Benedict Anderson uh, concept of imagined community, communities do not be distinguished by their uh, falsehood or legitimacy, but by the style in which are imagined. In this sense, there would be an idea and a collective const construction from that idea. Uh, on the other side, there is music as mediation. For anthropologist Georgina Born, music has a plural and distribu distributed materiality. It's multiple simultaneous forms of existence as sonic trace, uh, as notated score, and technolo as uh, technological processes, social and embodied performance, indicate the necessity of conceiving the musical object as a constellation of mediations. Music, she says, requires and stimulates association between a diverse branch of subjects and objects between musician and instrument, compose, composer and score, listener and sound system, music programmer and digital code. Music appeared to be an extraordinary, extraordinary diffuse kind of cultural object, an aggregation of sonic, social, corporeal, discursive, visual, technological, and temporal mediations, a musical assemblage where this is understood as a characteristic constellation of such heterogeneous mediations. Um, like coding has been constituted as a collective artistic expression that mediates and builds on sociabilities and subjectivities in a socio-technical context. Then, would be socio-technical mediations, mediations 
in the case of the light coding scene, because when technology is not only appropriated, but is being experienced by people, is in turn built. And the own experience with technological devices makes sense. Uh, those are some, uh, well, uh, um, authors of uh, socio-technical interaction, but the, the main uh, topics are that the social and technological are not meaningfully separable things. Social behavior influence, influence the technical choices um, and the system participants are embedded in multiple overlapping and non-technologically mediated social relationships and therefore may have multiple commitments. Well, new projects, um, uh, new proposals, proposal to demythify the relationship with technology, making the code a craft or artistic material, but more than anything, the construction of a participatory communi community, open spaces, um, a spaces to express and build transformations, not only in the artistic or cultural field, but also institutional. The lay coding scene involves building an entire world, an art world in terms of Howard Becker. Um, according to the, to the author, uh, who who cooperates in producing a work of art do not do it from nothing, but rest on past agreements, conventions, which usually cover the decisions to be taken. And this makes things simpler. However, Becker explains that people can always do things differently if they are prepared to pay the price. And well, uh, there is a, a quotation um, that talks about this um, uh, this uh, uh, what is to pay the price in order to to make things in in, in a different way in a new in, in new ways um, so uh, Becker says if that is true we can understand any work of any work as the product of a choice between conventional easy and success and unconventional travel and lack of recognition. A kind of uh, output that a uh, late coder found to this difficulty in build an art world um, was, I think, to place their, their art in the process more than in a finished product. So um, the emphasis on process in which materials, digital and analog, are more important than materiality or a final product allow light coders to have advance in the construction of their activity and uh, a, an, a, an art world. Always changing, exploring the role of technology in art and art in their technological forms. It is there in the construction of those environments in process where light coders feel creative and create from improvise, improvise, improvising <laughs> in the space of active materials. And as a conclusion, uh, regarding the social aspect of social settings from artistic practices, uh, art wars, if, as Howard Becker explains, conventions make it easier and less costly to build an art world, but more expensive and, diffi and difficult to make deep changes, then the case of lay coding broadly contributes to the acceptance of change as a, as a constant within a framework, a framework in which artistic expression is a process rather than a finished product. The light coding scene make change opens, openness and constant e exploration practices that constitute a creative activity. And this is one of the last 
quotation, uh, people expectations, anxiety, and concerns represent the formidable social power, the one who brings a group into existence. Thank you. You mean that there is a um, problem of uh, um, not uh, not so openness, maybe? Yeah. Is that something you've come across, or? <laughs> yeah, um, I I I remember uh, once talking to. Um, to Alex when he's uh, arranging the people that wi will participate on uh, algorithms and all that. And if, if there are women to, uh, to, to make a performance, all they are in. And, ma and w people that get uh, out of, of that algorithm, and in that case, are men, but uh, it's the experience that I have <laughs> with this group of like olders. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if answered your question, but I was just wondering if that was something you considered in this idea. Yeah. Of just yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I suppose it's a. Uh, um, I come. Yeah. It's, it's a difference between ideals and actual reality. So inherited maybe from the free software community, very strong ideals that people very forcefully defend, but um, are kind of undermined by if you do actually end up participating, <laughs> um, you do tend to be of a certain um, personality type and also gender. <laughs> um, and yeah, the idea of sharing and collaboration. Um, undermined by uh, unseen forces which stop certain kinds of people from participating. Um, do you have any answers for how to improve it? <laughs> <laughs> so it's a bit clever. <laughs> something that is happening uh, pretty much outside the academic uh, world, although there are some people uh, involved in the academic scene, but it's not that uh, strong in that, in that, in that way. Like the, the academic part is really not important in that sense. Uh, and I 
think this same phenomena might be happening in, in many places in the world. That may, many people is not around here. That actually would be interesting to have them around um, to discuss about these kind of things. But this is going to happen in every topic that you discuss um, inside the, uh, an academic uh, realm because uh, you're always, uh, we are always like uh, dismissing everything <coughs> that is not in this room. And yeah, I think that includes uh, gender uh, and, and racial uh, things. And uh, uh, I don't know if there, there are ways to, to like, you know, open this space is also like to merge what is the academic in the wild in a, in a better way or like in a more integrative way or way inclusive way. I think this is a challenge uh, for everybody, for each performer and for each uh, uh, academy. Let me check my settings. <coughs> uh, it's turned off on the Good. Great. Okay. Um, uh, uh, this talk is called Live Patch and Live Code. Um, and uh, I want to start by uh, it explores sort of uh, live uh, approaches to non digital computing systems. Um, so I want to start sort of uh, with how do we go to the next one? The, um, historical um, live systems. Um, the, the Moniac, I'm bringing this up partially because it's kind of cool, um, and also it's got a connection to Leeds. Um, this is the uh, Moniac, which is the Monetary National Income Analog Computer. Um, uh, the, this is the Mark II. This is one in New Zealand. There's one somewhere in the UK that actually works, but the Mark I, of which there's only one, is actually in the lobby of the business school about five minutes walk away from here. So during your break, the, the receptionist will happily point it out to you. It's really cool. Um, I didn't get any good pictures of it, so you get to look at the New Zealand one here. Um, it models uh, Keynesian economic theory. Um, it's a little bit hard to see with the lighting in here, but what you have is a bunch of little tanks um, and, and hoses. It's a water computer with uh, red dyed water in it. And um, you can uh, turn up a pump that says tax rate and pumps a lot of water into the treasury. And then you can turn on government spending and investment income and savings. And uh, water moves around the thing. And, um, in, in 1949, there was the idea of trying to create a stable economy by getting the knobs exactly right. Um, so this was, uh, people used these for years. They didn't fall out of uh, fashion until the 70s with the advent of monetarism and sort of the, the ditching of the idea of having a stable economy that's cheesy and benefits people. Um, so, uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, if, if you get the knobs wrong with this, you get a, a buffer overflow as a very literal event. 
Um, um, so this is absolutely a, a live system. Um, and then um, uh, it, it was used actually in research. Um, the guy who invented it was named Phillips and something called the Phillips graph that has to do with unemployment and inflation was partially worked out on this. So, um, But uh, sort of more general purpose, you've got um, analog computers. Um, this one isn't special aside from the fact that it looks really cool. Um, these are also operated very live, like uh, you would, and they're much more general purpose. You would um, plug in a bunch of patch cables, set initial con conditions, um, uh, and run simulations from an initial state. Um, and then um, uh, if you don't get what you want, um, you have to reset it to the initial state, which is slightly a pain. But um, um, it is absolutely live. Um, all of these modules you see it are, are function generators. That's function in the term of like for, I don't have a whiteboard, but for every x value you get exactly one y value. So every cable, physical patch cable is, is moving a, a voltage, a variable voltage that has to do with functions. So you could have like a, um, something taking the, uh, uh, say something that's generating a upwardly moving voltage and then something else that's taking a sine function of that and then running it through an integrator. Um, which, which is an idea that might be slightly familiar. Um, um, these are also functions, unit generators are also function generators in the same way that analog computers are function generators. Um, uh, so uh, writing a UGen graph is creating an algorithm. Um, and so there's this uh, thing that came up yesterday about the difference between live programming and live coding. Um, and while not wishing to court controversy, um, Something that is uh, considered an uh, important uh, part of live coding, uh, especially in one of Nick Collins's paper in 2011, is that live coding is perturbing an algorithm. It's not just establishing an algorithm, it's making a change to it. So um, uh, and, uh, this is part of the reason that I want to talk about analog systems, partially because I do it, but also because sometimes looking at sort of boundary weird cases gives you an insight into the thing as a whole. So when I write things saying I'm going to come to your live coding conference and I'm going to patch cables, they're like, well, you know, the algorithm doesn't change. So it's clear from reviewer feedback I've gotten, not just from here, but every other place I've proposed this, that perturbing an algorithm is an important part of live coding. <laughs> um, and that maybe is the difference between live coding and live programming, if we're going to have that difference. Um, um, uh, the other thing about perturbation, it, perturbations is that we tend to think of them in terms of control systems rather than, this is my synthesizer in a church, um, uh, uh, control systems rather than just the eugen graph, but like more the, um, the control rate stuff seems to be an important part of live coding. Um, uh, synthesizers obviously have the capacity for that kind of liveness and also for complexity, which seems to be less important than, um, now than it was in, say, uh, 2007 when the late and sadly missed Click Nielsen um, wrote a paper where he described an uh, email exchange he had with uh, Julian Moore Huber about um, uh, systems growing in complexity until the programmer can no longer tell what's going on anymore, which um, like I think probably all of us have experienced at some point, like I have no idea why sound is coming out or is not coming out, um, um, which is, again, a thing that can happen with a, uh, with a synthesizer. Um, um, I started um, doing live patching in um, about 2004-ish, um, and I didn't know anyone else doing it. Um, and so the way I started sort of intuitively was from um, a, a blank surface, and I would plug in cables until I had no idea what was going on anymore, and um, either the sound ran out of control or it just stopped. Um, which is an uh, approach that live coders use, but um, since I heard of TopLap, I've thought of ways that I can integrate live code performance strategies into synthesizer plugging because as we all know just because a system has capacity for liveness in live coding doesn't mean that it's necessarily so. So um, I've tried to apply these to synthesizer patching. Um, so for um, show us your cables as it is, um, <laughs> um, it's hard to see here because of the angle the picture is taken at but the um, synthesis an angle to the audience rather like the piano there off to the one side an angle, which means that if I were patching the piano, um, uh, most of the people in the room would be able to see what was going on. Um, I've ex from a distance. Um, I experimented at the, excuse me, the Live Code Festival in Karlsruhe with adding video projection to this um, with a, a webcam, um, and then for that, I thought the the Royal Conservatory of the Hague has a convention for cable colors, 
where um, control signals are in blue cables. I mean, obviously the cables themselves aren't, aren't different, but um, just so you can help keep track. Uh, blue cables for um, control rate signals, red cables for triggers, and black cables for audio rate signals. So I tried doing that, but what I found out is even here you cannot see the black cables at all on this nice high-res picture, and on a webcam, forget it. Um, so that, that didn't work out as well. And then um, I had, um, what? Get, these cables are expensive. Um, <laughs> um, uh, where was I? Oh, and then um, for, for a further pedagogical thing, um, I had the idea of, uh, um, because I was running a webcam anyway, I had uh, a little USB um, MIDI device, and when I plugged in an LFO, it would bring up a slide that said LFO that was sort of over the top, and people could see what was going on. Um, nobody else does this for live coding, and it was kind of a pain, so I, I've quit doing that. But um, <laughs> um, the, the experiments that I've done. And then um, uh, another thing that uh, seems to be important for um, live coding is um, not just building up a very complex graph, but switching between graphs. Um, so you, you do this on a synthesizer much the same way you do it in Mac, Max MSP or PD, is that both graphs, if you've got two graphs, they're both always running at the same time, but you can change which one or both of them are going to output. Um, it's also possible to make decisions with um, analog synthesizers. Um, uh, this particular one has a binary decision module where if um, a voltage goes over a threshold, it changes routing. But actually, even an envelope generator, um, if you're using it to control um, amplitude of something, is a way of making a decision because when the voltage is high, the envelope is going, and when it's low, it's not. So you know you're getting sound or you're not. Um, uh, some people also feel that scheduling is an issue with with live patching. Um, it's it's not something I've actually ever really worried about. Um, but um, if you are into scheduling, of course, analog sequencers are a thing that have existed for a long time. Um, but also, if you're um, planning on triggering an envelope and you've got any sort of stochastic triggering thing, you don't know when your envelope's going to fire. So you have the same sort of uncertainty in scheduling of future events is possible. And my talk has gone really short. Um, uh, and uh, does anyone have any questions? <laughs> yeah. How fast can you patch? Is that, isn't that important? <laughs> I, st I have all the cables around my neck, so it's like um, a, a, sort of a shocking scarf. Um, and um, oh, I remember why it's gone fast. I skipped a section. Anyway, um, uh, um, yeah, you plug them in, but I mean, you have to look at what you're doing. I think it's not a physical speed problem as much as it's a cognitive problem, um, which is also the issue of losing track of where things are going. And then you think you just have all the cables in front of you. and, and um, there's color coding here, so like um, I have three colors of cables and they each have six colors of ends, so I should be able to look at, but you end up running your fingers along them and what's going on, and um, so it's, it's uh, the, the speed problem is here, not here. Um. Funnily enough, I was having a conversation just before this session about um, what might lie in the territory between the symbolic and the sub-symbolic um, as being perhaps something that's distinctive about life coding. Um, I mean, this is part of the reason that I was um, talking about analog computers because um, uh, I, it has grown out of the, the symbolic and it's, it's become more practical. But um, I, I mean, I, I, I don't do patcher languages anymore because I find them annoying when you're not actually plugging them. But I, I feel like patcher languages actually are operating on a very similar level. Um, and um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I think the, the creation of a binary opposition there is problematic. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't actually know the answer to your question, but it's really interesting.
um, a very analog experience, I think. But if you're making lots of discrete techno or something <laughs> and using it as a, uh, and you can do that with an analog um, uh, machine like this, then um, it, it's a digital interface. Um, and just plugging in and, and out, that's, that's a digital on and off. Um, and as you, you point out, discontinuity is that's another digital layer. So I think um, everything is inherently hybrid. Um, and that uh, also always layered up to so have this analog system and sort of simulate this digital system in that, which is the laptop, and then use that to simulate another analog system, which might be a 3D world or something. Um, so I think. Yeah, I, I think people get a bit hung up on this, but analog and digital are clearly different domains, but they're always present, they're always used to find. The, um, the division between digital and analog is very much something that has arisen um, more recently. Like, um, uh, I was, you know, like the, the legendary laptop band, The Hub, they were using analog signal generators, especially in the early, back, especially when they were the League of uh, Automatic Composers automatic or algorithmic. Anyway, those were analog signal sources that happened to have a, a digital control mechanism. And um, a lot of people who were, especially in the sort of US West Coast scene that were doing the sort of home built electronic systems, as soon as they got um, like Kim computers or other digital boards, the first thing they thought is great, I can use this as a module to control my analog um, sound generation system. Because I mean, obviously there was no digital synthesis that anyone could afford unless you were at a massive institution. But um, the, the things very much went together in the early days. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever used the computer to control your synthesizers, live code on your synthesizer? Uh, um, I mean, you can get, um, I think I did something like this once when I was at The Hague. You can um, send out um, numbers to, uh, um, what do you call it, a, a, a digital to control voltage converter. And so then you're just generating sort of a number generator. Um, but I mean, um, at that point, what do you do with the number generator? You have to plug it in. And it's very much a divided attention problem. Um, I, I find it too hard to concentrate on both things. And, and at the end, all I'm getting out is a stream of discrete numbers. It's not that useful for the amount of work. Um, one thing that I have done is I played in a, a duo with a guy that turned out to be a live coder, although I didn't know what he was doing at the time. Uh, where I was sending him a, a signal in and he was processing it live. So I've done that kind of. Yeah. Um, how do you deal like with changing states like radically from one state to another? Like, I mean, for example, if you're patching in Max or PD, you can copy paste, make the changes and then repatch, but I guess you can't buy just another set of synthesizers and prepare your. If system. you give me a grant, I can, no. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is this is very much a limited system. I've got three audio array oscillators and uh, three filters that I can make oscillate if I need to, and I have, and uh, a low frequency oscillator. If I want more oscillation than that, um, I, I'm out. But I mean, um, if I were running PD on the Raspberry Pi, um, especially a first generation one, I would also very quickly run into CPU limits, so, yeah. Okay. Um, the thing I'm thinking about is the, is the interface. Because I'm thinking about what's different between the environments we use often in live coding on computers and 
that. And the thing that I, I got to right away was the fixed interface, that in our coding environments, we actually have these, often have these interfaces where we can kind of move things around, juggle them, reconfigure them for particular moments. And your specific setup that you're showing us in the photo is very kind of immobile. So, but there are, of course, there are other modules of the size of other artists working with modules of the size of the more little bits that they move around. So, I just wonder if you have any thoughts about the yeah, I mean, there, there's sort of a, to use the top line manifesto uh, between a chainsaw and an idea, where a tool is a chainsaw and an idea is a, a, an idea. Um, <laughs> and um, this does have something sort of chainsaw-like about it, in that the, the, it, it very much has tool aspects and, and um, interfaces for using it that are fixed. And if you are to patch something, especially if you don't grow to outrageous complexity, you know, you can start making predictions about what's going to happen when you when you turn knobs, and it becomes very much instrumental. I mean, um, speaking as uh, experience of a player, I, al I also play tuba, um, and that is a, a really embodied experience. It, it feels it's not it doesn't even feel like using a tool. It's almost like an extension of myself. And then there's live coding where um, uh, it feels very much like a, a, a cognitive activity. Um, which, um, honestly, I'm barely aware of being embodied when I program, so when people talk about programming gesture, it's not something I actually relate to um, in, a, in a certain way. But uh, this, this can be either way. It can be in between, depending on, on how it's approached. Um, and um, in, the, in the future, when we are supposed to have better interfaces for computers, like um, people doing weird 3D things that you can think, maybe, maybe some live coding interfaces will be more like this. Maybe not. I don't know.